Hello and welcome to Zim Explorer. I'm Dr. Abstract. And in this Zim Explorer, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, a couple of my students missed the lesson today, and I thought I would go over it with them what we did. So you're going to see what we do at Sheridan in interactive media, and I teach the creative coding. Oh, uh, we should probably turn down this music so that you can hear what's going on, or that so-called music. Do you like that Explore intro? It's, uh, I don't know what it is, underwater, underwater creatures. Okay, let's take a look then at, uh, this is Sheridan's interactive media program, and this is our interactive coding one. We have interactive coding two. I'm not going to go over the, the lessons and stuff like that. Uh, there is actually a video somewhere. If you go to the Zim site and look up interactive media, it's I think it's a feature of the learn section where we uh, go to Sheridan and I take you through some lessons in there. So there's a video going through some lessons. Uh, but we're down here in logic and flow and we were we had some assets for that. Uh, we're on efficiencies right here where we're going to do a falling and catching type game and we're using hit tests and loops and uh, intervals and things like that. So that's that's all in here. And we had two folders, crypto files. So I'm going to press on crypto files and grab that zip file. Uh, open that up. Mm, open the folder for it. It's my downloads folder. And there's the Chris, uh, crypto zip file. So you want to uh, open this up as well. And there's crypto. And here are some images and fonts that we're going to use. So I'm going to move that over there for a bit. And let's see. Uh, the other one that we want to get is crypto sounds. But why don't we deal with the, the files first? Uh, let's see. I have a folder called crypto. And, and that's in our interactive coding. Although this is just a local version. So I don't have the rest of the files there. But in crypto... I'm going to make a file called index.html. And sorry that that's really small. But um, anyway, you can't increase. Oh, well, I can. Plus, plus. I guess I can do that. Okay, so there's um, the index.html. And we'll put some stuff in there later. But we're also going to make inside of Chris Crypto right there, we're going to make a new folder called assets. And that's indeed where we want to put all these assets. So let's see if we can just drag... See if we can just drag from our zip here into that. I can't remember. No, we got to unzip it. Okay, so we need to unzip the uh, crypto.zip. So I'm going to go back to downloads, I guess, and just right click and say extract all. And that will go to a crypto folder here. Uh, there she be right there. So now this is the extracted files and we're going to drop them into assets. Okay, so there's uh, all of the extracted files sitting inside of assets there. Okay, um, why don't we just use those? The other ones are sounds and we're going to, we, we didn't do the sounds yet, we're going to do them tomorrow. So these are for some students who have missed today's lesson. Hopefully they'll be here tomorrow. And uh, therefore, we'll just use some of these assets rather than the other folder of assets too. But note, tomorrow you'll need that. Okay, going back to the Zim site now. Uh, well, normally we would go to the Zim site, boom, and hit code and say copy the template. And that brings in our template. You want to see what that looks like. So I went to the Zim site, hit code, copy template, and I'm going to paste that in here. Save her up and then right click and say open with default browser. And this is the template, this is in template right there. And we've done that a bunch of times in class. However, um, I've already coded all this stuff today, so we're not gonna recode all of this stuff from today, but rather <laughs> show you the rather hodgepodge file that we already have. And that's available in the Zim Beam. So, the URL, well, you guys should know how to get to, to Beam. Beam is down here in the footer of Zim. And then you want the one that says IC25 Crypto. So I'm going to just copy that. If you go to Beam like that, you would view an existing one. And it's IC25 underscore 
crypto. Uh, because in that folder, in the crypto folder, were various, uh, there's the Bitcoin icon and Ethereum icon. Actually, there's an ETH and an e Ethereum, and we don't need the ETH, so I'm going to get rid of the, the ETH completely. Delete. Um, because uh, it, it, oh, there's the Dr. Abstract head. But anyway, these ones are the various coins and Ethereum matches where the ETH one was a bigger one in a different color, like a blue color, and that would have been the same blue as Ripple, so we decided to cheat a bit and change the color on it. Okay, so there's our assets there, and then over back over here again, uh, we go to IC25 Crypto and View. That pulls up the code for that, and we can hit copy the code there, and then we are going to paste it into our index page. So we don't need that other stuff from the index page, and we paste. One thing I forgot to do all along is set a uh, thing here called Crypto. So let me do that now. <clears throat> All right, so we've just changed the title of that to be crypto. And if we take a look, um, we've started in loading some of those coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and Tether. So those are some of the assets that we're going to be using. We needed the coins to be just in an array of their own. And we talked about this thing called a spread operator. So we basically have just made a copy of coins and we have assets. And what that will allow us to do is later, it will add, allow us to add more assets. Like we can add sound in here, we can add font in there or whatever the files are. Okay, so, um, and, and then we can pass in the assets right here to the frame. And yet we've still got an array for the coins and that will be handy because then we can, uh, we can get only the coins from that coin array rather than from it mixed in with all the rest of the assets. So uh, anyway, that's a little bit of a start there. We are loading the assets in the path. And we've got a whole bunch of commented out code here because we were doing some basics for arrays and we were doing some basics for intervals. So we'll come back and we'll take a look at that. For now, uh, let's just see what we've got, the, the sort of the final um, file that we got to today in our three hour lesson was doing an interval here and we'll, we'll go through the interval but anyway once we've got an interval there's a few ways we can pick a coin to get a random coin and we'll talk about that but anyway once we have a coin we're going to locate that randomly across the width of the stage and uh, up above the stage and then we're animating it down to the height of the stage in some random number yeah we won't need a stage.update anymore but uh, you, you want to see what that looks like now. So the final file that we got to was here. And when we refresh, we should see some coins falling. So there they go. So we've got some coins that are going faster than others. They're randomly coming in across the top and we've prepared for our falling game. So tomorrow we're planning on catching those or dodging, whichever one we're, we're catching. Maybe like it would be kind of neat. Oh, catch this kind of crypto and you have to only catch the blue ones or you only have to catch the, the purple ones. So you can do variations of those games, but we'll look at the catching side with hit tests and conditionals. Like if it's hitting, then we've caught it and we can change scores. And uh, that's that's where we're heading. So that's what we're planning on doing tomorrow. We also did mention that we've got a few games all well more than a few games we've done many games in zim we've done a bunch of different types of falling games in zim probably like five of them available for you to check out and we just recently did an html5 games talk or a keynote talk and for that i made four different types of html5 games one of those was a falling game we've got videos about that falling game and we've got uh where, where can we find that let's just go back to the zim site so on the Zim site under, I think it's under, uh, might be under the learn. Let's see if we see some HTML5 games. Oh, no, it was under games. Okay, so back on the Zim site, if you scroll on down here under games, then here, here there, right up top, because we've just made tutorials about four different types of games. And indeed, one of these games is the falling game. Which one? Simple example, complex examples. All oh, right, okay, so you've got simple examples of the falling game is right here, bing. Complex examples of the falling game is right here. 
Then you've got tutorials on Medium. So this is like a textbook about falling right there. And then videos about making that falling game right here, as well as the same for all those other games. All right, so under uh, zimjs.com slash html5, or indeed right up at the top of the games banner, here is um, where you can find all that. Okay, coming back then to our code, I guess. We'll come back to our code. Most of the lesson was spent building up to this, talking about arrays and talking about intervals and loops. Uh, right, loops, yeah, that's right. So loops was part of this as well. These are sort of efficiencies. And let's then close that, and come back and have a look. Uh, actually, I've got this thing going in my other screen, which is kind of distracting. So I'll close that down. We'll open it up later. All right, so we started by talking about arrays. And here's what we went through. An array is a list of things like that. In some languages, you have to have arrays of the same types of objects, like these numbers. But in JavaScript, you can mix if you want and throw in a string. You can have arrays that hold zim circles. So arrays can hold anything, including even more arrays. And we show that down here with multi-dimensional arrays. Anyway, there's the list of things. And if you want to get access to any of the elements of the array, then we can use the array access operator right here. The array access operator and put the index inside. So you put the name of the array first, followed by the, the square brackets, and then at zero. So that's how we say it, the array at zero. And that will get the first index, the zero index. This is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three, that's four. So uh, we would zog that. Why don't we comment this out for now? and keep a nice simple zog and open, let's see. Um, I don't want to see all this other stuff happening. So I'm gonna comment out the bottom. So remember to comment, it's just you select it all and go control slash. And there it is all commented. So now we won't see a game playing. As a matter of fact, we won't see much, but we will see in the console. Zog is our log to the console. We're gonna zog in blue this time. So, Default browser. Oh, I didn't save it. So save it up. Note that the, it's a white dot up there. It means I didn't save it. So I save it. And here's what it looked like. And now I refresh. And that's all we've got. Um, F12 will pull up the console. If you're on a laptop, maybe function F12. And there, speaking of 12s, is us uh, logging to the console. 12. OK. Uh, to make the console bigger and smaller, I went control plus plus or control minus minus once you're in the console, and that will increase the size so you can see it there. Okay, so it said 12 because we got the first thing in the array. If we wanted to get uh, the zero, uh, if we wanted to get 19, 0, 1, 2, 3, even though it's the fourth object, it would be the index 3 because indexes start at 0. And we refresh here. And now it says 19. Okay. I'll put it back to zero. Um, you can get the length of the array. So that gets the length of the array. It's a property. It's the only array property, I think. There might be some others, but it's the only one we really use. And there it's saying there are five things in the array. So one, two, three, four, five. So if we wanted to get the last thing, this was a little bit tricky. If we want to get the last thing, we could um, go zog array at, and we would put, uh, we could say zero, one, two, three, four, and hard code four, but then if we ever change the length of the array, uh, four would be the wrong number. So it might be better if we wanna get the last thing for sure to put the length in there. But remember the length is five. So we really want the length Minus one, some simple math. All right, now if we do that, it should zog hello to us. And we come back here, and there it is saying hello. So we would spend a bit of time talking about all this and having people try it in class. So I didn't tell them how to do that. I had them try and figure that out themselves based on these things. Okay, but we're going through more of a telling thing right here because we're just trying to catch you up, certainly within an hour kind of thing. All right, so we can also push things on to the end of the array. So these are some methods. You see how that's dot 
push and then round brackets that's a method versus a property dot length uh, length doesn't have the round brackets so that's a property with the round brackets that becomes a method and that will push goodbye onto the end of the array and then here we are zogging down here, the last element. So if I undo that one, the last element's gonna be hello. Then I'm gonna push on goodbye, and then I'm gonna zog the last element again, and we will see goodbye. So when we refresh here, we have hello, and then goodbye. Um, so pushing things goes to the end of the array, and you have the comments for all these. Popping things takes elements off the array. So I'm going to pop it. So pop is a method that takes it off the end of the array and it then stores it or can store it in a variable if you want. So this returns the, what was removed and therefore we're putting what was removed in last. And so if we zog what was removed there, uh, there we go. So let's have a look now. So, uh, hello was the last thing. Then we pushed goodbye onto the end. And this is us zogging in orange goodbye. So right here in orange, we've zogged what we've taken off the end. So we did put it onto the end. Then we took it off the end. And now the end is back to hello. Okay. So those are two methods to add things to the end of the array and to remove things from the array. You can also change any array element. So for instance, we could get or change the second array element or the third one. So 0, 1, 2, that's uh, to 99. So if the array is up here, 0, 1, 2, this is us going to change 33 to 99. And anytime we can zog what the whole array is, and that's what we'll do there. So here we refresh. There's the whole array. And look at that, 33. It used to be 33, but it's now 99. So we have changed it from 33 there to 99. So you can access any array element and change it. Um, there's things that you can do to the beginning of the array. Unshift will add to the start of the array and shift will pull off the start of the array. So shift is like pop. Pop works on the end of the array, shift works on the beginning of the array. These words are strange, shift, unshift, pop, and push. They're, uh, they've been around since the dawn of code when coders out in a cafeteria noticed the way that plates were stacked into a dishwasher and the terms that the dishwasher people used. They used push, pop, shift, and unshift. So they use that in their code. It's one of the nice stories about coding. There's not really that many nice stories about coding. Like coding is pretty descriptive otherwise, <laughs> but this, is, this has a story behind it, <laughs> which is nice. And we still use that and they're used in most languages. So it's a little peculiar rather than you know add add end or remove end or something like that we've got push pop shift and unshift so those are four we also talked about these uh, methods right here you would put all these on the array sort sorts the array you can reverse the array you can find out uh, the index of an element in an array you can find out if an array contains something although you can also use index of for that if the array doesn't contain an index of would return minus one. So that otherwise it might start at zero if it's the first thing in the array, etc. cetera. Um, slice allows you to uh, remove parts of the array and, and receive those. Splice also allows you to remove parts of the array, but also put parts into the array. So you can do that. And concat will join several arrays together. So those, we just talked about those. We didn't really look at them. Uh, you're going to learn those in web development. Uh, raw, as, as Wasim takes you, Wasim is another teacher in web development at Sheridan, as Wasim takes you through um, raw JavaScript on the DOM. Okay, and this is, we're in Zim and we've got some basic stuff, but we're also moving as quickly as we can into some magical things, as, as we'll see soon. So that was talking about arrays. I'm going to comment out that stuff. And then we are going to looping. Oh, we'll need the array because we looped through the array. Ah, wasn't quite all of it though, was it? Yeah, we forgot the nested arrays. So this little bit right here is a nested array. It's an array of A, B, and then another array inside that. So you see how this is a string, here's a string, and this element is an array. And inside that array uh, are more things. Okay, so once again, you can have as many nested things as you want. Um, they can be any types of objects, etc. And then the way you get them is you ask for the nested array at two. This is zero, 
that's one, and this whole thing is at two. So basically this part right here is the same as this array element right there. So we can then ask this array element at one, zero, one. Get it? Okay, and that will end up showing D. All right, that's about all we did with that. And as mentioned, I'm gonna comment this stuff out and come on down here and talk about the loop, but we do, we loop through the array. So I think we need that one there. Okay, and here's the loop. Loops are pretty well in all languages and here's a raw JavaScript loop for, and we let i, a variable i, start at zero because that will get us our first index. We're trying to loop through this array. So we're gonna let i start at zero. We're gonna keep on looping as long as i is less than the array's length. So, uh, cause that's the index. We wanna go zero, one, two, three, four, not zero, one, two, three, four, five. Five is the length, but we only want the indexes to go zero, one, two, three, four. We're starting at zero rather than one. So we do not go less than or equal to there, but just less than is fine. And then we increase our i each time. i plus plus means add one to i. Okay, there's other ways too. You could decrease minus minus. You can uh, plus equals two to go up by twos. But anyway, we, usually we just go up by one. And then inside the loop, so this, this uh, block right here in between our brackets, so that's it. You for something, you do what the code between these brackets, this block of code. And we're zogging what i is each time. It will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then we're zogging what's in the array at i. So the first time it loops, it will be the array at 0. And it will show us 12. The next time will be the array at 1. Then at 2, then at 3, then at 4, but not 5. Because it's only going up to less than 6, which is the length. Okay, so we take a look and see if that's true. We spent more time doing that. As a matter of fact, we didn't zog both things. First of all, we just zogged the I, and then we had you guys try and figure out how to get the elements of the array because you, you would have known everything. So we didn't give you this. We, we asked, how do you get each element? This will only get the I's. See that? So if we refresh here, it only got the eyes. And then we asked you guys to try and figure it out. So that's what you missed when you were in class. You missed that sort of processing. Could you do it? Could you not do it? I would say about a quarter of the people don't realize that what they need to do is access the array, array, at, and then if you put zero in here, some of them put zero in there. And yet it always shows the very first element of the array. We want the elements as, they, as the index goes up. So that means you have to stick the eye in there. And sometimes that's tricky. Uh, so anyway, we told you how to do it. That's too bad. You could have seen if you could have figured it out yourself. There we go. That's a loop. We also can loop through each element by applying a method of the array. So this, this works as well. We take the array and we apply a for each method. And each time we're given the item when we call this arrow function. And we can zog the item. So that also works. Then there's the zim loop, which is very versatile. So here's the zim loop right here. Loop 10 times, and you're given the index i. And then we could zog the i. So you want to see that? This is, these are going to be in blue. And we commented out the other ones. And we refresh here, and there's blue 0 to 9. OK, 10 times, starting at 0 to 9. So those are the indexes. So that's a zim loop, but you can also loop with the zim loop through an array. You say, hey, loop through the array, and each time you're going to be given the item. All right, so similar to that method. Uh, the zim loop is very handy. You can loop through a container of things. So if you have a container of circles, you can loop through them. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that tomorrow when we do the hit test. We're going to loop through all of the coins. Um, and that they'll be in a container. They're in a container so we can easily loop through them. Yay! And that will allow us. So there's a variety of different ways, in, in which case at that point we can say the container dot loop like that, and we're just given the item in the container. Uh, you're given more than just the item. Maybe you want the index as well. So if you want, you can collect the index. I actually didn't go over this with people, but um, and you can also find out the total in there. So oh comma i, comma the total as well. If you need within the loop, if you need the total, or if you need the index, then you get those things as well. 
Okay, and recall that when you have an arrow function, we went over this as well, when you have the arrow function and there's only one parameter inside, then you don't need the uh, round brackets there. So that was the loop stuff, and we'll practice loop again. Then there was an interval right here. The interval, a, a loop happens so fast that you can't really do anything in it. It just happens immediately, and then the next bit of code happens. Whereas we want things to fall, and we want them to fall over time. So we're going to now use a, a raw interval right here. This, this started off with just set interval. It's a JavaScript command. It's actually a method on the, the window, I believe, but uh, if you leave off the window, then it assumes it, it works like that. So set interval, and then it will call you call you put a function in there to run, and then you give it the interval in milliseconds. Ooh. All right, so a thousand milliseconds is one second. And this will call set interval each second. So let me refresh here. I think I commented out the loop stuff. So here comes set interval and set interval and set interval. You see that happening there? Okay, and at each second it's calling set interval. So this will help us with our falling, as you can imagine. There's also a timeout, and the timeout it works the same way. Here's the function to call, and the timeout only happens once. So if we run it at one and a half seconds, then the timeout will, will have an interval first. There's the set interval, then a set timeout, and then the set interval again. Note that when it repeats in the console, it just puts a number here, but because it got interrupted by something different, uh, that's why it spreads it out in the console there. All right, so those two things work in a similar way. Um, and we actually made, uh, right, okay, so we made, uh, we put this in a variable so that we could, in this set timeout right here, we could clear it. So after five seconds, we can clear the interval if we, if we call it a name, const enter is equal to. Okay, and you see, see what we've done there? That gives us an ID for this interval function. Otherwise, it'll just run forever. And now we've set a timeout after five seconds to clear the interval with the clear interval function. Set interval function, clear interval function. You can clear a timeout too. And you pass it the ID there. So let's see, this should only run uh, up to five seconds. So once, twice, three, four, five. And then it stops. Okay, because it got cleared. <clears throat> All right, so that's raw JavaScript stuff. Then we introduced the Zim interval right here. Uh, which is generally easier. So the Zim interval looks just like this to start. Interval, one second. So first of all, we use seconds with the Zim interval and ca call a function. And note that there's switch. So it's interval for one second, call this function, which matches everything else. Loop three times, call this function. Uh, this circle dot on click, call this function. So the calling of the function comes second and the, the thing that we're you know, whatever we're doing comes first. So um, we switched the order and we shortened it to interval rather than set interval. And it also has lots of fun things. You can do a timeout. The timeout basically looks the same there, uh, very similar, put the time first. Uh, in this case, we also assigned it to that and we made a timeout of five just to match the other one exactly. We timed out five and we cleared the interval. So a slightly different way to clear it rather than clear interval or anything. It's the interval object right here, dot clear. Okay, so that um, is the Zim interval. And then it has, and, and we showed the matching click, for instance. Click and then call the event object. We don't have a circle. Then we showed how flexible the, the interval is. So this is the Zim interval. First of all, it's annoying to have an interval that runs every second, because if we had a falling game, everything would just, once a second, something would fall, and that becomes quite boring. Oh, it's going to fall. Here it falls again. Here it falls again. And again, each second, or whatever. You can have it 0.5 seconds or 3 seconds, but it's still always the same. So you have to do some raw coding to actually call timeouts and make the timeouts call their own timeouts so that those timeouts can have random times and it's just sort of a, a self-referential function that's kind of confusing. So in Zim, we made it so that you can pass in an array, uh, sorry, a, an object literal with a min and a max. And that way you, it'll pick a range of that. If you passed in 
an array like that, it would pick from the array. It would pick either one, two, or three seconds. If you passed in a series, one, two, three, it would do them in order. The first time it would be one second, then two seconds, then three seconds, then it would repeat one second, two seconds, three seconds. And that can be good for making a song or something like that. So it's very powerful. You can also um, set the it to a results of a function and that function could return the setting on a dial or something. So you could use a dial to change the speed of your interval. So that's very handy. It's called the ZimV value that we've talked about. It's dynamic parameters in Zim. So there we are setting the time. Another thing you can do is you can receive an interval object right here. And that can give you the count. It can give you what the interval is. It also lets you clear it. So we could say something like, if the object's count is greater than or equal to five, then clear the interval. Isn't that neat? So we don't need all that other stuff, that, like the interval.clear and stuff. We can do it right from within the interval, nice and easily, because we have an interval object. So we decided not to do that. What else um, the Zim interval gives you is how many times this should run. So you don't even have to bother clearing it after five. You can just say, run it five times. There it is, because we know that we want to do that sometimes. So the next parameter is how many times to run the interval. That will only run at five. And this one is run right away. So that's good as well, because um, sometimes you don't want to wait for one second. You want to just run the thing right away, then wait one second. And so that is the Zim interval. Yay. OK, uh, good. And we described all that stuff. And it was wonderful. Yay. Everybody went, oh, clap, 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 clap. No, they didn't, but they might have. All right, and now we come back to our game. So this is the, the stuff that we have that's running, and we're almost there. How are we doing for time? Uh, not too bad. Half an hour. Yay. Oh, is that right? We could have done this, this whole lesson in half an hour. How did it take three hours? It took three hours. Uh, first of all, we did a bit of a review of the last lesson. So we, we had probably about a 20 minute review of what we had done previously. Oh, and just an overview of all of the modules. So I went over the modules again. Uh, we've been going through the modules and the lessons pretty quickly. So I just wanted to uh, give a description of where we're at. So I did that. Um, and then, of course, we gave people time in class to explore all of these concepts that we've just seen. Okay, because there's some important programming basics. So back to here, coin, interval. Okay, we're in an interval with a min of one second and a max of uh, one seconds. Sorry, a min of 0.1 seconds, so that's pretty quick, and a max of one second. And then we want to drop a coin, and the coin is going to be, it's going to be one of the pictures. And we showed several ways to get a picture. So if we want a new pic, we, we would go up here. Why don't we... I think we can comment that out now and we can collapse all of those. So I've hit the little arrow to collapse all that batch of comments and, and that allows us to see things a bit better. Bitcoin. So if we take the bitcoin.png here and stick it right in the pick, then the interval, no matter how fast it's going, we could take that away and just say one second all the time. But anyway, there's the interval. Then the coin each time that it's getting is going to be the Bitcoin PNG. Shall we have a look? And we refresh here, and it's a Bitcoin PNG. Why don't we make these? These are now starting just off the screen as well. We didn't start that way. We started just by putting the screen, the, the, the coins on the screen. So I'm going to comment out the animation and make this 100. And let's have a look and see what happens. So we refresh. Now the coins, oh, now there's a mistake somewhere. Scale, new pick, coin, dot loc. Oh, we need a stage dot update. Okay, s dot update. We're no longer animating the coins. So that means when we add a coin, we need to update. We can tell, like it looks like nothing got added, but watch, I'm going to change the size here. Oh, and all of a sudden a bunch of coins are there. So we, are, we were adding these coins uh, by locating them right here by locating them on the stage. And we, uh, if we don't have a stage.update, we wouldn't see them. So now we've got that stage.update, and here they are. So you see how they're coming in kind of randomly, a certain speed randomly. Bup, 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 bup. Okay, and they're coming in across the stage. So how did we do that? Let's have a look. 
All right, so we're locating at a random from zero, that's the left-hand side, to the width minus the coin width. So we made sure that we made the coin first and scaled it. And then on the next line, so we didn't chain it. Normally we can chain a loc on there like that. But if we chain the loc on there, we wouldn't have access to the coin because all we have is the new pick. We don't have the coin yet. It, it only becomes a coin once we do all this stuff and assign it to the coin. So that was an important um, point there that we pointed out. <laughs> important point that we pointed out. So we have on one line here, ending here on that semicolon, we've made the coin, then we took the coin and located it and animated it. Because then we know the coin's width so that we can put it across. Otherwise, if we didn't use the coin's width, it almost works between zero and the width. But watch what happens. You ready? We come in here. And when we refresh, we'll start getting some coins, and I don't know if we'll see it, but eventually a coin is going to go off the end here. Oh, I don't, ah, there it goes, off the end. The coin will never go off the start because it starts at zero, and the registration point of the coin is at the top left corner. So that means it's going to be placed from the top left corner here. So even if it were zero, it would still be top left corner. But if it goes all the way over to the width, that's way over here, It it it's top left corner could be right here against the width and therefore the rest of it's off the screen. All right, the other another thing we did is we said, ah, oh, that doesn't have to be 100. We could make that rand and make it a random zero to the height of the stage. Okay, so that's its Y position and now our coins all of a sudden can go anywhere. But we're still gonna run into a problem here in that some coins will go off the bottom. They won't go off the top because the top left corner is going to be zero or bigger. But once it gets to the height, the top left corner, if it's the height, is going off the screen there. Okay, so that's why we needed the width and the height. For that, I'm just going to undo uh, right there to stop the coins from going off to the right. And we'd have to stop the coins from going off the bottom, but we don't have to bother with that. Okay, so we were randomly putting some coins there, but one of the things we wanted is how do we get random coins? So there was a few different ways. We could say the coin name is go to the coins array, because remember we have a coins array up here? There it is right there, coins array. We're wanting to get one of these strings, and that's why we left an array of only these and made it so that when we go and get some other assets, blah, 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 and here we could get a bunch of things like our sound and anything else to catch it. I think we're gonna make these coins fall on Dr. Abstract's head. Okay, those would go in here, but we would still have an array of just the coins. Yay. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're asking the coins to give us the index at a random number, the coin's length minus one. We never want to get the index of the coin's length, we saw that earlier when we looped, but we want to go up to the coin's length minus one. And by default, rand will start at zero, or we could put zero in here. Okay, so this is a random number between zero and the coin's length minus one, and we're getting whichever coin is there. So if, if it's zero, it would get Bitcoin. If it were one, it would get Ethereum. If it were four, it would get Tether. Okay, or sorry, if it were three, it would get Tether. Tether, zero, one, three, it would get Tether. Okay, but it would never go up to four of the length. So that was one way to get a random coin. Another way is to shuffle the array. So that shuffles the coins, it puts it all out of order. So each interval, it gets shuffled again. And then we get the first one. Because remember, we only want one of these. So if it shuffled it, uh, Ethereum might come first and we get that. Um, if we shuffled it again, Ripple might come first, or Bitcoin, or Ethereum again. And so every time we shuffle it, we're just getting one of them, and we may as well just get the first one. That's the easiest. Okay? Although it's conceptually a bit tricky, but pretty easy to do. Then we said, well, okay, that's how we did it for a long time. Then we said, well, and shuffle is a Zim function, so is RAND. Those are both Zim functions. Uh, then we made another function called pluck, and pluck just gets something randomly out of an array. And if you put the true here, then it will remove it from the array as well. It'll pluck and remove it. Pluck actually sounds like it's being removed, but it doesn't remove it unless you put the true there. So this will get a random thing from the array. And each time, by the way, uh, we're, we're using coin name, so then coin name would come in here like that. Bing, coin name. Okay, and let's see if this 
plucks from the array and gives us random things. Because right now, it's just filling up with Bitcoins. And so here we go. We should see them go in a big line along here. There they are. All right, isn't that cool? We're getting random coins. Yay! Uh, let's see. But the easiest way is we don't even need to, to do that because pick right here can use a ZIMV value. And if you take a look at the ZIMV values, they're in here somewhere. ZIMV values, they are an array. So if uh, an array, in other words, if we just pass in the array of coins, it's going to pick randomly from that array. Isn't that wonderful? So that's what we want. We just pass in the array. Or we could have passed in a series, then it would pick the coins in order. Uh, or we could, uh, in this case, we can't do a min and max, but we could do a result of a function. Okay, so the, those are the other ways to um, do the ZIMV values. And come back here though. There is our coins. So in other words, we put the array in here, coins, that's it. And Zim will automatically say, well, you know, you can't, you can't provide an array to pick. Uh, you need something, so we're going to pick from that array one of the things that you're telling us. And are you ready? We get the same thing. So we refresh here. Sorry, I just refreshed. And indeed, we're still getting random stuff. Okay, so the easiest way. Then we're wanting to animate. So we'll uh, open up the animate. We're going to animate the Y property to the height. The height is down, down below. That's the height of the stage. Okay, so we're going from zero up at the top, well, actually 100 at the top so that we can see them, and we're animating down to the height. We're animating in a random time. We're easing linear. Why don't we remove all this and just see what happens? Okay, so now all we're doing is animating the height in one second. So as they come in, oh, it looks like we're going to that. Yeah, because our registration point is at the top. And so it's just stopping down below there. So let's um, bring that up so it doesn't quite go to the height. We'll go height minus 100 so that we can see where they go to. You ready? Bing. Now there they go animating down. But do you see how they start off slow, then they fall, and then they slow down as they're arriving at the bottom? That is the easing. And note that they're still left on the bottom. So we'll want to fix that up. We showed a couple things in here. One was the ease. If we go ease colon bounce out. The default ease is a quad which slows down and then speeds up and then slows down again, or sorry, starts off slow, speeds up and then slows down. Uh, we better change the time on this though, time colon four and put a comma in there. So we're now animating at a time of four, we're bouncing out and here's what we get. Uh, it's quite cute. So now as they fall, it takes four seconds and then they're bouncing out. Okay, remember, they're magically appearing at 100. We'll, we'll move that up above, and then they're all bouncing. But they still hang out there. So we just goofed around with that for a bit. Uh, neat, huh? But we want an ease of linear, which is uh, constant. So then it's going to be quite boring if we see four, four seconds going at a linear speed. There they are. But you can see that that looks like falling. As long as we start off the screen, it's like they've been falling through the sky. So we want to start off the screen at the top and go below the screen. But first we should find out how do we get rid of these things? Because we don't want them just all piled up. We're not even seeing them anymore. They're off the screen, but they'll take up memory. So what we do is when the animation is done, we do a call. So the call is what function to call when the animation is finished. And that function is given the object that was animated. Okay, much like the event object in a click event, it gives, we get the target of the click. We also can get the target, we just call it that, the target of the animation right there. Um, note it is not E, and then you don't go E.target. Uh, there's no other event object stuff. All we really need is the target. So we just collect the target there. That's how we've set it up in Zim to do that. Events are different. They've set it up in a different way to get a different event object. And then the event object has a reference to the target and the current target and things like key codes and stuff like that. Anyway, um, we get the target and we can use the target.removeFrom. That would work. 
but better, uh, the problem with that is it's still held in memory because we might use it again. We've just removed it from the stage. It's, it's less memory, but uh, we might use it again. Target Dispose will delete it from memory as well. So that's the one that we're going to use. It will remove it and, uh, and delete it from memory. So here we go. And when that gets to the bottom, we'll see them become disposed. All right, now that we know they're disposing, we're going to make it fall from above the top here to below the bottom, and that's where we got to. Okay, so that was minus 100, so up a bit, and then just to the height because the registration points at the top, so if we go to the height, it'll be just off the bottom. You know, if, if you wanted to, you could also say height plus 10 or something like that just to make sure, but height's fine. Um, we've hard-coded four seconds, so that's, so it's another thing that we have to deal with. But basically, now they're falling from up above. They're falling a bit faster because they have to go a bit farther. They have to go come from 100 up above there, uh, down to the heights. So there you go. Okay, mesmerizing, huh? Um, but uh, if we want, we can set that time to be random, which is what we did. And so instead of hard coding a four, we went give us a time, a random number between three and five. And this is what we get. So they're now falling at slightly different speeds. Okay, you see how some fall faster and some falls. Probably you would want to make the ones in the front fall faster and the ones behind fall slower. Then it gives a bit of a parallax feel. But anyway, that's beside the point. And we're going to make these fall on ahead, and we'll do that tomorrow. Yay! So what do you think? Did you guys have fun? I don't know if you're watching this, like, but this is these are what our lessons are like. Uh, we spend time learning. You're welcome to come take those lessons with us at Sheridan. <laughs> I think you have to pay, though. Uh, Sheridan College is in Canada. And once again, if, if you do uh, want to find out about that, if you go to Zim here and go to the top of Zim under Learn, so if we scroll down here, there's intro, canvas, videos, lessons, uh, articles. Okay, where is it? It's in here somewhere. There's tutorials. There it is, college. So it's under lessons, I guess. Lessons. There's code pen lessons on creative coding. There's the kids lessons, Zim Kids. There's Zim School uh, for usually for teens, I guess, and even right into college and stuff. We, we assign homework um, from Zim School where you have to do this stuff over and over again uh, and then here's college so if you press on that it's uh, that's where we are we're in the skate building right here it's a little bit about our program interactive media uh, some more about dr abstract and you can get reviews and see oh right here and a video scroll through the lesson so we i teach interactive coding one six units in the first term and I teach interactive coding two, six units. That means six hours a week in the second term and the terms are 14 weeks. Uh, with assignments, projects, tests. Oh, did we say tests? Quizzes, <laughs> we'll call it. All right, and there's a video scroll through uh, that from a few years back. All right, there you go. This has been a Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract. I'm glad that you're here with us and come on into Zim, zimjs.com and then zimjs.com slash discord, forum.zimjs.com. Cheers. Have a great day.